Nancy Cunard. Nancy Colric on March 1896 70 March 1965 was a British writer, heiress and political activist. She was born into the British upper class and devoted much of her life to fighting racism and fascism. She became the muse to some of the 20th century's most distinguished writers and artists, including Wyndham Lewis, Aldous Huxley, Tristan Sorrer, Ezra Pound and Louis Aragon who were among her lovers as well as Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, Constantine Brancusi, Langston Hughes, Man Ray and William Carlos Williams. MFF documents reveal that she was involved with Indian socialist leader V. Kelvin Krishnamenon. In later years she suffered from mental illness and her physical health deteriorated. When she died in the hospital coach in Paris, she weighed only 26 kg 57 pounds slash 4 stone 1. 1910s. Her father was Sobot Connard and now to the Connard land shipping businesses, interested in polar and fox hunting and a baronet. Her mother was Maud Alice Burke, an American heiress, who adopted the first name Emerald and became a leading London society hostess. Nancy had been brought up on the family estate at Neville Hall, Leicestershire. When her parents separated in 1911, she moved to London with her mother. Her education was at various boarding schools, including time in France and Germany. In London, she spent a good deal of her childhood with her mother's longtime admirer, the novelist George Moe. It was even rumoured that Moe was her father, and although this has been largely dismissed, there is no question that he played an important role in her life while she was growing up. She would later write a memoir about her affection for Jean. On 15 November 1916, she married Sidney Fairburn, a cricketer and army officer who had been wounded at Gallipoli. After a honeymoon in Devon and Cornwall, they lived in London in a house given to them by Nancy's mother as a wedding present. The couple separated in 1919 and divorced in 1925. At this time she was on the edge of the influential group The Coterie, associating in particular with Iris Tree. She contributed to the anthology Wheels, edited by the Sittles, for which she provided the title poem. It has been said that the venture was originally her project. Connaught's lover Peter Broughton Adderley was killed in action in France less than a month before Armistice Day. Many who knew her claimed that she never fully recovered from Adderley's loss. Paris. Nancy Connaught moved to Paris in 1920. There, she became involved with literary modernism, surrealists and Dada. Much of her published poetry dates from this period. During her early years in Paris, she was close to Michael Arlen. In 1920, she had an fatal hysterectomy for reasons that are not entirely clear. She recovered and was then able to lead an active sexual life without the fear of pregnancy. A brief relationship with Aldous Huxley influenced several of his novels. She was the model for My Revive Isha Antique 1923 and for Lucy Tantamont in Point Counter Point 1928. In Paris, Connaught spent much time with Eugene McCown, an American artist from the hard drinking set whom she made her protege. It has been suggested that she became dependent on alcohol at this time and may have used other drugs. In 1928, the year she founded her publishing company, IO's Press, she met Henry Carter, with whom she lived until 1933. Personal Style Connaught's style informed by her devotion to the artifacts of African culture, was startlingly unconventional. The large-scale jewellery she favoured, crafted of wood, bone and ivory, the natural materials used by native craftspeople, was provocative and controversial. The bangles she wore on both arms snaking for Mr. Elbow were considered at very dormants, which provoked media attention, visually compelling subject matter for photographers of the day. She was often photographed wearing her collection, those of African inspiration, and neck pieces of wooden cubes, which paid homage to the concepts of cubism. At first considered the bohemian affectation of an eccentric heiress, the fashion world came to legitimise this style as avant-garde dubbing it the barbaric look. Prestigious jewellery houses such as Bouchon created their own African-inspired cuff of gold beads. Bouchon, issuing costly gemstones, incorporated into the finished creation green malachet and a striking purple mineral, purpurit, instead. It exhibited this high-end piece at the Exposition Colonial in 1931. The Iris Press in 1927, Connard moved into a farmhouse in La Chapelle Rainville, Normandy. It was there in 1928 that she set up the Iowa's Press. Previously, the small press had been called Three Mountains Press and run by William Bird, an American journalist in Paris, who had published books by its editor from 1923, Isopand, William Carlos Williams' The Great American Novel, Robert McCormand, and Ernest Hemingway's In Our Time. Connard wanted to support experimental poetry and provide a higher paying market for young writers. Her inherited wealth allowed her to take financial risks that other publishers could not. The Eyes Press became known for its beautiful book designs and high-quality production. It brought out the first separately published work of Samuel Beckett, a poem called War Scope 1930, Bob Brown's Words, and Pound's A Draft of XXX Cantos. 
Cunard published old friends such as George Moore, Norman Douglas, Richard Aldington and Arthur Simmons, and brought out Henry Music, a book of poems from various authors with music by Henry Crowder, two books by Laura Rething, the collected poems of John Rodko, poems by Roy Campbell, Harold Acton, Brian Howard and Walter Lowenfalls. When Henderson had taken over day-to-day -day operation of the press by 1931, in the same year it published its last book, The Revaluation of Obscenity by Sexologist Havelock Ellis. Political Activism in 1928, after a two-year affair with Louis Aragon, she began a relationship with Henry Crowder, an African-American jazz musician who was working in Paris. She became an activist in matters concerning racial politics and civil rights in the USA, and visited Harlem. In 1931, she published the pamphlet Black Man and White Leadership, an attack on racist attitudes as exemplified by Connard's mother, whom she quoted the saying, Is it true that my daughter knows a Negro? She edited the massive Negro anthology, collecting poetry, fiction, and non-fiction primarily by African-American writers, including Lanston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. It included writing by George Padmore and can also an account of the Scottsboro Buzz case. Press attention to this project in May 1932, two years before it was published, led to Connors receiving anonymous threats and hate mail, some of which she published in the book, expressing regret that are obscene, so this portion of American culture cannot be made public. She identified as an anarchist. Anti-fascism. In the mid-minus 1930 she took up the anti-fascist fight, writing about Mussolini's annexation of East Europe and the Spanish Civil War. She predicted, accurately, that the events in Spain were a prelude to another world war. Her stories about the suffering of Spanish refugees became the basis for a fundraising appeal in the Manchester Guardian. Connaught herself helped deliver supplies and organise a relief effort, but poor health caused in port by exhaustion and the conditions in the camps forced her to return to Paris, where she stood on the streets collecting funds for the refugees. In the pages of Sylvie Pankhurst, the New Times and Ethiopia News, in a comment on how ingrained race and colonial prejudices were even among the left, she suggested that had the Spanish Popular Front government engaged the goodwill of its colonial subjects, the fascist rebellion against the Republic might have strangled where it first broke out in Spanish Morocco. In 1937, she published a series of pamphlets of war poetry, including the work of W. H. Auden, Tristan, Sora, and Pablo Neruda. Later in 1937, together with Auden and Stephen Svender, she distributed a questionnaire about the war to writers in Europe. The results were published by the Left Review's authors Take Sides on the Spanish War. The questionnaire to 200 writers asked the following question. Are you for or against the legal government and people of Republican Spain? Are you for or against Franco and fascism? For it is impossible any longer to take no side. There were 147 answers, of which 126 supported the Republic, including W. H. Auden, Samuel Beckett, and Rebecca West. Five writers explicitly responded in favour of Franco. They were even more Edmund Blunden, Arthur Machen, Jeffrey Moss, and Alina Smith. Among 16 responses that Carnard, in her eventually published compendium, grouped under the sceptical heading neutral, where H. G. Wells is a pound T. South, Elliot and Vera Brittain. The most famous response was not included, it came from George Orwell, and began, Will you please stop sending me this bloody rubbish? This is the second or third time I have had it. I am not one of your fashionable pansies like Ordino Spender, I was six months in Spain, most of the time fighting, I have a bullet hole in me at present, and I am not going to write blah about defending democracy or gallant little at anybody. Several other writers also declined to contribute, including Virginia Woolf, Bertrand Russell, East, M. Forster, and James Joyce. During World War Roman II, Canard worked to the point of physical exhaustion as a translator in London on behalf of the French resistance. Later lie. After the war, she gave up her home at Rayenville and travelled extensively. In June 1948, she travelled from Trinidad, the National Archives of the UK, QU, Surrey, England, Board of Trade, Commercial and Statistical Department, and Successes, Inwards Passenger Lists. Class BT26, Peace. Passenger hash 15 on the first page of the passenger list, passengers boarded at Trinidad. After Trinidad, the Empire Windrush picked up passengers at ports in Mexico, Jamaica and Bermuda until finally discharging everyone at Tilbury Ducks for London on 21 June 1948. To the United Kingdom, on board the. The voyage in the ship later became well known because the other passengers on board included one of the first launch groups of post war West Indian immigrants to the United Kingdom. In September 1948, she started renting a small house in a French village, La Morfainland, in the Dordogne Valley. In later years, she suffered from mental illness and poor physical health, worsened by alcoholism, poverty, and self destructive behaviour. She was committed to a mental hospital after a fight with London police. 
After her release, her health declined even further, and she weighed less than 60 pounds when she was found on the streets in Paris and brought to the hospital coaching, where she died two days later. Her body was returned to England for cremation, and the remains were sent back to the Saint-Pierre du Père Lachaise in Paris. Her ashes rests in urn number 9016. Tributes Constant in Brancusi's La June Philosophist Decree Portrait de Nancy Connaught, a Polish bronze on a cove marble base 1932, sold in May 2018 for US 71 dollars million with fees at Christie's New York, setting a world record auction price for the artist. According to an account of drafts of the poem Nancy Connaught by Mina Loy held in Yale University Library. Works Outlaws 1921, Poems Sublunary 1923, Poems Parallax 1925, Hargrove Press, Poems Poems 2 1925, Aquila Press, Poems Poems 1930, Black Man and White Ladyship 1931, Polemic Pamphlet Negro 1934, Anthology of African Literature and Art, Editor, Authors Take Sides 1937, Pamphlet, Compiler Los Poetas del Mundo de Fiendan al Pueblo Israel 1937, Paris. Co-editor with Pablo and you did the white man's duty in analysis of the colonial question in the light of the Atlantic Charter with George Padmore, 1942 Poems for France, La France Libre, London, 1944 and Poems à la France, Secours, Paris, 1947 Relevant to Marquis, 1944 Grand Man, Memories of Norman Douglas, 1954 GM, Memories of George Moore, 1956 These Were the Ayers, Memories of My Ayers Press. Braville in Paris, 1928, 1931, 1969, Autobiography Poems of Nancy Connard, from the Bodleian Library, 2005, edited with an introduction by John Lucas. Selected Poems, 2016, edited with an introduction by Sandeep Palmer.